Yeah, so um, it gives me great pleasure. I've seen his name um, on the attendee, so um, to introduce Anil Malhotra, Professor Anil Malhotra, um, who is a consultant cardiologist and old friend um, from um, St. George's. We trained together a few years ago now. Um, Anil is an expert in sports cardiology, um, amongst other things, and uh, he will be uh, talking to us today uh, about cardiac screening and evaluation of athletes. So, um, Anil, thanks very much for coming. Um, and uh, I will hand over to you, Anil. Thank you. Thank you, Bas. Thank you, Ellie. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you well. Thank you. And can you see my uh, slides, my opening slide in presenter view or normal view? Um, I'm not seeing, I'm just seeing you at the moment, Anil. Okay. Let me just. We, we can see the slides actually. All from right. Here. Okay. Okay. Is it my my view then? Is it? Um, okay. You can see the slides. Can you? Uh, let me just open that. Is is that yeah. okay? Yeah. We can we good. can see them. Thanks. And in presenter view or normal view? Presenter. That's presenter mode. That's perfect. Uh, as in the full screen of that. Sorry, I don't. Um, I, I just I just want the full slide. Yeah, it is. It is full. That, that is presenter mode. It's full screen view. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, so thank you, everyone. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to give this talk uh, about cardiac screening in athletes. Thanks to everyone for um, attending so far, and I hope that you continue to stay after my talk. Um, Abbas and Rachel in particular, thank you for the invite. So I want to talk about cardiac screening in athletes and we can start by having a quick overview of sudden cardiac death in young athletes um, and by young I mean between the ages of 14 to 35 and the incidence varies widely between studies from about one in 15,000 to one in 100,000 and the mean age of death is around 18 years old. There's a significant male preponderance and certain populations have been deemed higher risk, including black athletes in the UK, particularly among sports such as football and America, such as basketball. And the vast majority occur during exercise um, and just as many have no prior warning um, symptoms supporting the argument that such conditions need to be sought amongst athletes. We can now consider the, uh, uh, consider the causes of sudden cardiac death and the largest case series worldwide of sudden cardiac death amongst young athletes revealed that those aged 17 years were particularly vulnerable and that cardiomyopathies were the main component. Um, and those include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC and dilated cardiomyopathy that you're going to hear more about. But these are conditions that may have been detected during life. And our own experience of studying older athletes who died suddenly in the UK around the age of 29 years have shown that electrical conditions have likely been underestimated in the past, leading to a paradigm shift in our understanding of considering not just those aforementioned cardiomyopathies, but also other electrical disturbances such as long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome and accessory pathways such as Wolf Parkinson White. So, Let's consider screening strategies for detecting serious cardiac disease and the causes, as I've just shown, are quite diverse. A new single screening test will identify absolutely everything. So there's a balance to achieve between maximising the effectiveness of cardiac investigations and obtaining a diagnostic yield. And history alone has been shown to be a poor discriminator for cardiac disease. And examination isn't much better, perhaps identifying those with connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome more readily. The ECG detects electrical diseases as expected and most of the main cardiomyopathies, whilst the echo may actually miss those electrical conditions. But the cardiac MRI may also miss the electrical conditions, but is the gold standard imaging modality for cardiomyopathy connective tissue um, issues and coronary artery anomalies as well as myocarditis. But this, of course, does come at an increased cost as well as more logistical planning that's required. 
So the ideal screening test for assessing young athletes needs to be relatively cheap, easily available, and identify a significant proportion of athletes at risk with a low false positive rate and low false negative rate as well. And a number of scientific organizations and sporting bodies worldwide do mandate some form of cardiac screening for the athletes that are participating under their jurisdiction. And the ECG has actually been found to be the most sensitive tool at detecting conditions associated with sudden cardiac death, as high as 94% from a large meta-analysis by Kimberly Harmon's group. But the ECG also has a high specificity and a good positive predictive value. And as such, the ESC does endorse a protocol with a history and examination and an ECG when evaluating athletic individuals with, with most electrical conditions detected from this, as well as a high sensitivity amongst those with more common cardiomyopathies amongst athletes, namely hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, with a number of pathological features, most commonly abnormal T wave inversion. And I know that subsequent talks will elaborate on these changes. So what's the evidence that cardiac screening is effective? Well, I think the Italian experience is always put up to support this argument, and they reported a reduction of sudden cardiac death among screened athletes represented by the red line over two decades, with the rate falling from 3.6 to 0.9 per 100,000 person years in those that were screened below a level amongst unscreened non-athletes. But there's also a low incidence of sudden cardiac death, and there actually is a wide range when reporting this incidence amongst young athletes across the world. And this incidence is dependent upon the population studied in terms of age, athletic status, methods of, of obtaining sudden cardiac death reports. But what is apparent is the need for large, well-defined population-based studies that are large enough to generate the number of deaths required to adequately study incidents and provide longitudinal outcome data. And the visibility of such tragedies is amplified in football as the most popular sport worldwide, with approximately 250 million registered players. And this was recently estimated, well, the instance of sudden cardiac death was recently estimated at about one per 100,000 in a study of professional footballers over the last 17 years. And there have been a number of high profile sudden cardiac deaths that have occurred in football and received so much media attention, but the challenge of defining the denominator amongst the nation and the world's most popular sport, as well as only hearing about the most high profile tragedies, poses a challenge to actually estimating the incidence of sudden cardiac death in this particular sport, which is an example of what I believe is an underestimation. And I'm going to come back to that point. Another issue with screening athletes is the high number of false positives. And while the ECG does help detect cardiomyopathies and primary electrical disorders, which account for the majority of sudden cardiac deaths in young athletes, as I've shown, concerns still remain over the false positive rates with significant clinical, psychological and financial implications. And these rates are as high as 32% among white athletes depicted by the grey bar using the European Society of Cardiology initial recommendations of how to interpret the athlete's ECG, and up to nearly half of black athletes represented by the black bar having a false positive rate. Now, this is a slide that I've borrowed off um, my colleague Nabil Sheikh, and it's an excellent slide that highlights the increased repolarization or ECG changes amongst black athletes called T wave inversion, which is sixfold higher amongst this population and an eightfold greater increase in left ventricular hypertrophy, making it more difficult to differentiate what is normal physiology and pathology. And you're going to hear more about this, but I'm simply going to show an ECG pattern of abnormal T wave inversion that was previously considered abnormal, but now since longitudinal studies by Michael Papadakis and the group, this is actually considered a normal variant, particularly when preceded by a convex ST segment shape um, found in isolation and just limited to V1 to V4 in up to 12% of black athletes. So this is now deemed a normal variant. And taking such ethnicity driven factors into account and also age related um, ECG changes like the juvenile pattern into account. Recommendations for interpretation of the athlete's ECG have evolved 
over the last decade or so or so. And applying the latest international criteria, we can see that the false positive rate falls to as low as 1.7% amongst white athletes and just 3.6% amongst black young athletic individuals. So the international recommendations seem to strike a very good balance in helping overcome the challenge of the number of false positives. And there will always be concerns related to false negatives, which may be due to congenital abnormalities or um, quiescent coronary or um, channelopathy disease. And then you've got acquired conditions such as myocarditis or electrical uh, electrolyte disorders, which may also present themselves despite having a normal screen. But I'm just going to come back to the point of my um, or the underestimation of the incidence of sudden cardiac death and also report the outcomes of a cardiac screening program in a well-defined adolescent cohort. And as part of the Football Association's cardiac screening program, which is one of the largest in the world with respect to mandatory screening for 16 year olds across all 92 professional clubs, um, the screening program actually comprised of an ECG and an ECHO between 1996 and the subsequent 20 years of over 11,000 athletes. Now, whilst the vast majority were male and the vast majority were given the all clear, there were those that did require further evaluation. And 42, i.e. 0.38%, were diagnosed with some form of cardiomyopathy, structural disease, or electrical problem that is associated with sudden cardiac death. Because an echocardiogram was also performed, 2% of individuals had a minor structural or valvular issue that requires ongoing surveillance. And there was a cohort with abnormal repolarization changes such as T-wave inversion in the context of a structurally normal heart or those that had borderline changes and no diagnosis, diagnostic criteria were met. But 42 athletes did reveal conditions capable of causing sudden death and 2% revealed congenital abnormalities. But coming back to our original point, the ECG was the most sensitive tool to identify these conditions, which were mainly electrical, and hence the sensitivity of the echocardiogram was not as high. And if we look at the prevalence and detection of the cardiac disease, amongst those 42 individuals with these conditions, the cardiomyopathies and long QT um, were advised against competitive sport in line with guideline in, in, in line with those guidelines at the time. There were structural and congenital problems that were treated surgically and returned to play. And the vast majority of Wolf Park, in fact, all, all of the Wolf Parks and White players did return to play. So the vast majority were alive, three quarters returned to play, and two did die against medical, uh, uh, who, who competed against medical advice. I mean, if we just look at the deaths that occurred amongst these this cohort, there were those associated with young people, for example, road traffic accident deaths, drug overdoses, suicides, and unfortunately cancer, but cardiac conditions also accounted for a significant, in fact, the most of the deaths. In total, there were eight, and it showed that the incidence actually of one in nearly 15,000 equates to up to seven per 100,000, so greatly um, higher than previous estimates. And there was a, a six to eight fold um, higher uh, incidence amongst black footballers compared to white, albeit in small numbers. I mentioned the two deaths from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but what was apparent is in the six other deaths, five of them did have some form of cardiomyopathy. And this is likely to have presented later on or been detected later on using the ECG alone, given the sensitivity of the ECG. And unfortunately, there was also one um, case of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome um, that demonstrated a normal initial screening as well. But the time between screening and sudden death was approximately seven years, and the mean age of death was 23 and a half years. Summary, from our experience, the incidence of sudden cardiac death amongst adolescent football or soccer players is about one in 15,000. The prevalence of such conditions is about one in 0.38%, which are mainly electrical. Three quarters of those diagnosed with a condition 
could return to play, and most deaths were from cardiomyopathy in athletes with normal screens at the age of 16. And there are two ways of looking at this, but the European way is that screening adolescent athletes is effective for identifying electrical diseases, but the detection of cardiomyopathies would require serial assessments. And that's the counter argument to perhaps a more cynical view of such conditions actually being missed as opposed to they hadn't actually presented themselves. So in line with this, the European Society of Cardiology has been supported in its protocol in that the international recommendations have now been shown to have a low false positive rate in both white, black and even mixed race athletes now. Serial assessments can be used in order to detect cardiomyopathy and therefore in line with this, more players are being um, uh, screened more serially. You have to have correct interpretation of such tests to help reduce the number of false positives. And also other um, pathological features of the ECG have evolved and, and, and we need to further our understanding, for example, of lateral T wave inversion amongst white and black athletes and examining other ECG patterns in more detail. For example, those associated with myocarditis, which has become a lot more um, of an issue in the COVID slash post COVID era. So in conclusion, um, there have been an overwhelming number of studies that demonstrated that ECG screening is effective for detecting or highlighting cardiac disease. Apart from electrical diseases, the ECG is effective in detecting athletes with cardiomyopathies, mainly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or most commonly, I should say. Contemporary criteria are associated with a significant low false positive rate amongst white athletes and an acceptable false positive rate amongst black athletes as well. Echocardiograms and, 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 and cardiac MRI can add value to identify structural heart disease, although they do come with logistical barriers as well. And a normal screen doesn't necessarily protect from sudden cardiac death and therefore, as we've seen most recently um, in, in, in on a global platform, the benefits of secondary prevention have been extolled and adequate secondary prevention should always be made available for athletes irrespective of their primary prevention strategies being used. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Inigil. So I think we've got a little bit of time for questions, Abbas. Should we do a few? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think we can because uh, our next speaker, Nabil, um, is at half past. Um, then, uh, Anil, thanks for that talk. That was a really nice, um, succinct, succinct uh, summary of um, the evidence and, and current practice. Um, uh, I think the, the Italian slide, you know, it's the most famous slide in sports cardiology. Um, uh, you know, one could argue it's the only sort of the closest thing we have to like almost like a randomized controlled trial in the sense that you have two cohorts that were, you know, had different treatments and were followed up for a long period of time. There is a lot of criticism about that data. Um, you know, that uh, there are lots of criticism that they had a higher death rate um, than other countries that, you know, the death rate swings up and down anyway. and they had sort of started at a peak and it would naturally have troughed. You know, what, what do you make of that, of that sort of comment or criticism? Yeah, I think, I think as it stands, yes, there are significant limitations, uh, as there are limitations to every study. Um, I think it has supported the Italian government in their endeavours to mandate screening, not just amongst athletes, but amongst school children as well. Um, and yes, there are, um, limitations as as you've highlighted the Italian data or uh, sorry the Israeli military data as I'm sure you're familiar with also has significant limitations as well so I think what the aim of that slide was to do is that that is the only longitudinal at the time prospective outcome data that we have to show that oh, what they have reported as a reduction of sudden cardiac death. But that's why I also emphasized the other objectives of, of, of cardiac screening, which is identifying conditions and then managing those conditions. And given the familial tendencies of these conditions to identify other 
family members who may be at risk. And that's why our study was um, quite nice in that it showed that identifying a problem is one thing, whether or not it reduces the sudden cardiac death rate or not. And that's also why I emphasized um, the importance just at the end of secondary prevention in AED and CPR, but it's important to be able to manage these conditions. And that's what we are being posed. Uh, these are the challenges that are being posed to us in clinic. Someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, are we going to erroneously, firstly, erroneously label them? Are we going to miss this and say, oh, it's all ethnicity related? Are we going to curtail a potentially an amazing career? Or are we going to shatter someone's dreams unnecessarily? So that's why I this one of the objectives of this talk as well is to help share the information that we know and present the data in its current form and also help try and advance the data with future studies. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Anil. Um, got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we have Sarah Gibson asking, um, how do we define competitive sports participation? We often get asked by families um, if their children can continue to take part in school sports as well as those who are taking part in sports at higher level like team, county, etc. Because you know most of the data that gets presented at these at these kind of conferences and, and the studies that we do are on those very high level athletes. Yet we know that you know there's a, a yeah, big burden. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think I agree, and I think that's an excellent question. Um, we end up having to extrapolate information from the tip of the pyramid, um, where rightly or wrongly, the resources seem to be aimed at. Um, but there's no reason why someone who's running around the playground or, or playing football, um, you know, um, just as actively um, should not be subjected to a similar sort of process. Um, and to answer the question directly, around four hours of exercise according to the European Society of Cardiology a week constitutes an athletic individual so that encompasses a lot of school children um, competitive level is those who seek uh, place a premium on on achievement within sport so that's a bit more subjective but what we can say is that the lessons learned from studying the tip of the pyramid can then be filtered down to even grassroots level as well OK. Um, Ellie, sorry, go on, go on. I was going to say there's another question in the chat as well from Dirk Wilson. Um, what do we do about CPVT? I, I suspect that might be kind of yeah, mindful I think, Papadakis. I think CPVT is a very... Uh, yeah, Michael Papadakis is, is going is, to talk is, is about... Yeah, Michael will be doing a lecture on sports participation in inherited uh, cardiac or exercise in individuals with inherited cardiac yeah, conditions. Yeah, and I I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add. Yeah, I, I think what Michael has also added before his CPV talk is uh, it's best to accurately uh, assess the sport and intensity of sport, although elite competition puts an extra level of complexity. And I, I think that's right as well. Um, uh, uh, the intensity of sport in particular. Uh, but CPVT, yeah, if Michael's going to cover that, then, then we can cover that later because it, it, it is a challenging aspect that may only rear its ugly head in certain situations. So thanks very much, Anil, uh, for that uh, excellent talk. Um, and I believe Nabil is in the house. So um, 